I was just, I think, um, I think most of my interest in bio lies specifically in like the biomedical aspect. Because back in year three, my first ever research internship, it was on, I think, coming out with a cell, a cell model to test the toxicity levels of liver cancer drugs. Yeah. So the reason why I didn't take bio in A levels or like in JC was because I'm very interested in a very niche part of bio in a sense versus I guess the A level syllabus would be something that's more broader. So I think how I pursued my interest, my specific interest in biomedical sciences was just through my research projects and so on. But in terms of teaching, I guess, where I am now and also my Olympiads and other research as well. Why I did physics was because I also enjoy physics as well. So yeah, I think just not restricting myself to thinking, oh, you know, I take PCME, I can only do physics. I think a lot of the biomedical stuff was things that I read up on my own time as well, and specific to my research project as well. I'll just read up papers that my mentors sent me or papers that I, dig up, I dug out in my own time. So I think it's definitely possible to pursue your interest in all three sciences without necessarily taking three sciences in JC, since that's not an option anymore. Yeah. Mm, I think for me, I always had some interest in the biomedical sciences from a young age. I didn't really want to be a doctor, but I was interested in, you know, what causes diseases and things like cancer, I guess. As, as a kid, you, you already know what cancer is. You know, it's this incurable disease that nobody has come up with a solution to. So I guess that sort of got my curiosities ignited in a sense. And then when I signed up for the science mentorship program in year three, I think that was when I first saw the project, one of the research projects available was what I mentioned just now about liver cancer cells and so on. So I thought that was really interesting. And why I got into research specifically was because also sort of similar to what I said, I'm interested in the biomedical sciences, but I found that what we were learning in the secondary school curriculum wasn't really delving deeper into that. So I wanted more of the depth versus the breadth that was offered in school. Yeah, so that's why I pursued research. And I find that research in general involves so much outside the academic syllabus. And I find it a lot more exciting. Yeah, so that's why I started doing research. Yeah, definitely. I think the thing is that each of my research projects were, even though they are all in the same overall field of biomedical engineering, right? But each of them are also very different because within the field itself, there are so many different areas you can specialize or go into, right? So I guess the reason why I just kept doing research was because each of my projects were focusing on different things. So another project I did later on was on developing, I think, test kits to test for bacteria in meat samples. That's, that's one. And then another one was on biomaterials, I think. So we were doing something like hydrogels, I guess. So it's just sort of material that can be used for wound dressings. We're working on developing that as well as developing a device that can apply these wound dressings in a sense for people like, let's say, burn patients in the future. Yeah. So I think all of them were very different. And, and uh, another, the last, I think the most recent one I did, if I remember correctly, or what I did in RSI, another research program I went, was bioinformatics. So what we were doing was we were sort of sequencing people, cancer patients' genomes and trying to identify where are the mutations specific to different cancers and whether we can potentially come up with more targeted treatments based on the specific mutations that cancer patients have. So in a sense, you can see that even though it's all biomedical engineering or bioinformatics, they're all still very different. And I just find it very exciting how each of my research projects allowed me to just learn and delve into each of these new fields that I wouldn't have ever had the chance to do so if I didn't do research. Mm, definitely. Yeah, and I think, mm, I guess personally for me, when I have free time in a sense, I like to find fulfilling ways to use my free time. So I always thought that research was just very meaningful, even though I might not necessarily end up being a researcher in the future, just having the chance to go into a lab, actually physically do experiments and gain exposure to what how people apply science in the real world and what that looks like in the workplace. I thought that was very exciting for one. And of course, secondly, what I said early on as well, just being able to keep learning new things and just explore my curiosities in a sense, in a way that I couldn't possibly do so just by doing my tutorials and lectures in JC. Yeah, that's what motivated me to keep doing research. Yeah. Hmm. I think, in a sense, I didn't really have a choice because a lot of the research programs that I went for, the, pro the projects are allocated to you based on your interests. So I only got to choose the field that I was interested in. So biomedical engineering, for instance. And then the specific projects was just mostly allocated. Yeah. Mm, I think in a sense was, again, what was available in a sense. Because when you are in secondary three, I think, there's just not a lot of opportunities for research in general, right? Because you're so young and they really need programs that cater to 
someone who is so young with zero research experience whatsoever. So SMP was my starting point. It was some of the only option in a sense, but I think it was definitely a good starting point. And then how I got into my next research project, which was called YRP at ASTAR Nanobiolab, is because my SMP project was actually at Nanobiolab. And then they also have this youth research program at the, at the Nanobiolab as well. So they just said that, oh, if you're interested in doing more research, you can possibly sign up for our programs and we can just connect you to a mentor directly. So the next holiday after that, I think in December of 04, that's what I spent my time on. Yeah. And then why RSI was? Because I wanted to try something new. I think, unfortunately for me, RSI was COVID. It was COVID year, right? So it was online. But otherwise, we'll have the chance to go to the MIT campus physically and actually do research and interact with everyone else there. Something that motivated me to join RSI was not just the research on the science part, but also just, I think the RSI program is structured such that you're doing your research, but there's also a ton of social activities and stuff for you to interact with the other scholars from other countries. So there's the game nights, um, I think we have a poker night, slanky fashion night, and some other interesting events as well. Yeah, and there's also a lot of a, a distinguished lecturer series, I think. So they got some people who discovered, made, who made huge discoveries in the fields of astrophysics, for instance, or even economics to come and give us talks as well. So having that sort of interdisciplinary focus where I don't have to just do research, right? I can talk to other scholars who are doing research projects in, for instance, as I said, astrophysics or other areas of biomedical sciences, it's like neuro, the neurodegenerative diseases, right? And also having the exposure to the alumni, the faculty members who are giving us such lectures as well. That was what really drew me to apply for RSI in the first place. I think that's what made it so distinctive from my other research projects. Since it really goes just beyond the science as well. Yeah. Mm, I think when I come to a new topic, because, yeah, as, as you mentioned as well, I don't actually have a, a strong background in biology. So what I would do is just, firstly, is just look at the project, the scope, right? And look at the abstract as well. And then if there's anything I'm not sure, firstly, obviously I'll ask my research mentor. But secondly, I think just taking the time to delve into each term and each concept individually and just reading out separate research papers on each individual concept in a sense. Yeah. So for instance, mm, let me think. I think for one, for my RSI research project, as I mentioned, we were trying to discover, we were trying to figure out a way to a bioinformatics pipeline sort of thing that we can sequence cancer patients' genomes to identify mutations Right? And then afterwards, we can come up with medicines that can target those specific mutations. So I was researching on precision medicines or, like, or targeted treatments. I was researching on bioinformatics pipelines that are already present in the field. What are some of their limitations and so on? And then how does our approach differ from that? Yeah. So yeah, just in a sense, being able to delve into each individual concept, reading it up, rather than just being overwhelmed by this whole new thing that you have no idea about at all. Resources. Hmm... I can't think of anything specifically off the top of my head. But I find that in general, when you search up papers, you should be able to find some open source ones. Yeah, it's not honestly the best solution, just Wikipedia. For all the, con all the concepts or terms that I don't know, just go straight to Wikipedia first. And then you look at the references that Wikipedia page has, and then you build up from there. Or else, I think in general for research projects, your mentors will usually send you two or three papers, either by them as well, or just other papers that are similar to what you are doing. So you just look at those papers and again, if there's things you don't understand, look them up and then look up more research papers relevant to that. So research is a lot about reading, I think, especially when you're first starting out. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so what I did was, because I was really, really bored <laughs> during Circuit Breaker, so I bought this A-level physics guidebook. I think it's by CS2. I have it on my shelf now. <laughs> yeah, it's still here. I haven't, I haven't thrown it away. Yeah, so that was where I started off from. I just sat down every day for, I think, say around 2 to 5 p.m. in the afternoon. And I just sat down every day, I just started reading. And anyway, I didn't know anything. Then I would search it up, firstly. And secondly, also do the problems. I think phys in physics, it's very important to do problems. Because if you just read and memorize formula, you don't remember anything. Or you remember it, but you don't know how to use it. So it's pointless. So just doing a lot of problems, I think, and starting out with the A-level syllabus first. And then once I was done with the entire book, the H2 syllabus, I still had some time left. So I, I think I just searched out some textbooks online, some undergraduate textbooks, like let's say like University Physics, right? Or um, just Physics by, I think like Halliday, Resnick and Crane. Oh, I didn't butcher their names, but that's the, they, those are the authors of that book. And then, yeah, so I just worked through the chapters slowly. I did not finish the second textbook, but I think having that, a-level foundation in SEC4 already definitely helped in the Olympiad. Yeah. And then whenever there are things that I didn't know, 
again, just Google. <laughs> I think Google really has a lot of resources. You can go to things like Stack Exchange, for instance. You can literally just type the problem that you have. Sometimes people have asked the exact same problem from the textbook before. Then you see how people explain it and try to understand. I, I think, sorry, I think beyond the resources though, a lot of it is just you really require a lot of tenacity and perseverance to get through the books in the first place. Especially when you realize you don't understand anything. And then you just feel very stressed, I guess. Or very depressed. <laughs> but what matters is just being able to push through and just to keep searching and keep Googling and not just give up. I think that's way more important than the resources that you have. Just the mindset that you approach physics with in the first place. Yeah. I think, surprisingly, I'd say it's similar. A lot of tenacity and perseverance, for sure. Because... I'm thinking about when I did SYPT as well, then essentially my project was on the friction oscillator, right? And there were so many times my setup just failed or just stopped working all of a sudden for just no reason whatsoever. And I guess that's just research. Sometimes things happen and you really have no idea what's going on because there's no teacher there to tell you like, oh, your setup has this issue. Sometimes the teachers won't know as well because you're the one building the setup, right? So a lot of it is just trial and error, a lot of troubleshooting as well. So I say that in research, you really need a lot of tenacity and perseverance. Even more so than if you're doing, let's say, A-level, studying for A-level. Because at least in A-levels, you have a fixed answer, right? In research, you have no fixed answer. Nobody tells you what, what went wrong. So just having that ability and faith to keep pressing on and to keep doing and to keep experimenting and improving your setup until it finally works. I think that's the most important trait needed in research. And I think secondly would also be a fundamental curiosity for the subject in the first place. Because if you don't enjoy or you're not curious about it, then there's no reason why you would want to keep delving deeper into it to try to expand the scope of your project, for instance. So for example, for me, I guess, since like I mentioned, all my biomedical research projects were things that were very new to me. So I think having that curiosity to want to keep learning, even when I didn't understand half a paper, but having the that curiosity to want to keep looking up all of these different terms, trying to understand fully what each and every single paragraph meant and trying to understand the entire gist of the paper. I think having that inquisitiveness, I guess, and the interest in learning as well is really important. Yeah. Mm, I think, okay, I guess if you are watching this and you are considering whether to apply for SYPT, I think my biggest piece of advice is if you don't make it, you don't lose anything. So you might as well just try, right? If you are interested. If you don't try, you would always regret what if I had first, what if I had tried for SYPT? What if I had gone on to do it and then, I don't know, went on to IYPT or something? You know what I mean? So if you are considering applying, just apply. You don't. You really don't lose anything from applying. Maybe a few hours of preparing, but you have a lot of hours in the day. So just apply. That's my first piece of advice for applications. I think SYPT itself, I find that it's just difficult, and that is just the nature of SYPT. <laughs> so I think if you want, if you are scared of failing in SYPT, there's no solution to not fail. It's more of just. The only advice I can give you is to just don't be scared because you will fail and that is just how SYPT is. I'm sure you have experienced it as well, right? <laughs> Since you did SYPT as well, right? So yeah, advice is just don't be scared. You will fail and you cannot avoid it. So you better face it. And what happens is when you, how you pick yourself up from those failures, right? Whether or not you are like, okay, I give up. I can't do this problem. Then I just won't finish it by the competition. Or will you just keep trying? And maybe you won't finish, but at least you try and there's still a probability of you finishing it by the deadline, right? I mean, for me, a lot of my project, my, my SIPT project was sort of rushed out near the last month because my setup just wasn't really working or sometimes it just failed randomly for no reason whatsoever, as I mentioned. So a lot of my data collection was near the last month. And I guess something else that happened as well that I guess not only people know of is that my thumb drive with all of my SYPT data, it actually got corrupted somewhere in the last month as well, in the first month. So all my data was just disappearing randomly by itself. And I was just, so all my hard work from the past few months was just gone, evaporated, right? And then what do you do? You, you don't just say, okay, I'm going to give up. I'm going to sit down and cry now, right? Obviously, you just find time, just spend longer in the lab, recollect all your data and make sure you finish it and finish your report in time, right? So as I say, as my main point is, you will fail and things will happen. Sometimes it's not that you are failing. Sometimes something just goes wrong. Like my thumb drive just corrupted itself for no reason whatsoever. So what matters is just you pick yourself and you go on. Even if you don't finish, at least you try. And if your report has holes, then fix it. And if you don't fix it, then just go in with what you have and just try your best. I know it's very generic advice, but based on my experience, I think that's what best characterized my SYPT experience as well. Yeah. Sure. Go Pesco! <laughs> <laughs>